Hello, and welcome to Buffy and the Art of Story Season 5. This podcast looks at story elements in Buffy the Vampire Slayer one episode at a time. Today we're looking at Season 5, Episode 6, Family, where Tara puts her friends in danger in an effort to hide who she believes she really is. I am Lisa M. Lilly, novelist and founder of writingasasecondcareer.com, where you can learn more about fiction writing, publishing, and book marketing. As to family, today I'll talk about drawing the audience through the story by linking scenes with images, language, and theme, having the characters ask questions that are in the viewer's minds, using metaphors to convey theme and heighten emotional impact. And the way repeating certain words in dialogue helps move the story and convey both theme and character. There are no spoilers except at the end when we'll hear from a special guest, Elena Campobasi. Elena will talk about themes of family, community, and identity in season five. Okay, let's dive into the Hellmouth. Family aired the first time on November 7, 2000, and was written and directed by Joss Whedon. Most stories start with an opening conflict there to draw the audience in. We do get that here, but before it, we start with the equivalent of an epigraph. That's a quote before a novel or a chapter that suggests its theme. Willow and Tara are in bed, and Willow asks Tara to tell her a story. The kitten is hanging out with them, being cute, and Tara starts once upon a time about a kitty who is all alone. Willow finds this very upsetting, but she's reassured when the rest of the story shows the kitten being adopted by some nice people. And this is a wonderful metaphor for this whole story and signals the theme not just of family, but of adopted family versus being alone. Now we get to the conflict, though it is very minor. Willow's tired, and Tara asks if she minds if she keeps the light on. Tara wants to look up some spells. This could be because she knows her birthday is coming, though she doesn't say that to Willow. And that's the way that this opening conflict relates to the rest of the story. Willow says to Tara, you've been spell gal night and day lately. Tara responds, well, I just want to keep up with you. And, um, well, I like to be useful, you know, to the gang. I just never feel useful. And usefulness is another theme that we'll see throughout this episode, or at least a word that we will hear repeated. Willow assures Tara that she's essential. They get in bed together and Tara turns out the light and asks if Buffy found out anything useful tonight at the factory. Willow figures if she had, Buffy would have called, which leads us into the next scene where Buffy and Giles talk about what Buffy learned. So that's at 1 minute 42 seconds in. And we join in media rests. I've talked about this in other episodes. It's where we join in as the action goes forward and as the audience have to catch up. And it's just so well done here without cramming in a lot of explanations. What is going on comes out through conflict between Buffy and Giles. They talk about whether Buffy will tell Dawn, but neither of them says what they will tell Dawn or not. Buffy says, how can I? She'd freak. And that's the last thing we need. We have to keep her safe. Giles points out that this woman knows Buffy now, and maybe she should send Dawn away, perhaps to her father. So the reference to this woman tells us there's a looming threat out there. It also reminds me that we don't know Glory's name in this episode, and we won't find it out. I've been using Glory because it's easier in terms of breaking down the episodes. As to her father, Buffy says... He's uh, in Spain with his secretary, living the cliché. 
She tells Giles she called her father when Joyce got sick and he never called back. And she remembers Dawn cried for a week when he bailed on them. And Buffy continues with a line that reminds us about Dawn. Buffy says, except she didn't. She wasn't there, but I can still feel what it was like. They sent her to me, Giles. I think I have to take care of her. I want to. And this both clues viewers in, if they're new to the show, that a bit about Dawn and shows a little bit of progress for Buffy. Despite all her frustrations with little sister Dawn, she does feel in her heart that she wants to care for her. The question about Buffy's dad is one that viewers might be asking themselves. We haven't seen Hank Summers in quite a while, but he is still out there in the world. And viewers might be wondering, why doesn't Buffy think about Dawn being safer with her dad? There could be a lot of reasons why she might not be, but this gives us the explanation of why Hank Summers isn't around and isn't even considered an option. Giles says they need to find out who the woman is and why she needs Dawn. And the scene ends with Buffy saying, she'll come, she'll come for us. This leads right into the next scene at 4 minutes, 11 seconds in. Glory bursts out from under the concrete that fell on her in the last episode and says, okay, now I'm upset. And we go to credits. All of this tells us that this episode picked up exactly where the last one left off. After credits, at 5 minutes 13 seconds in, it's a sunny day on campus. Buffy and her friends are moving boxes out of her dorm room because she's moving back home, and Anya complains about just having brought all that stuff in not long ago. Giles says, people help each other out, Anya. It's one of our strange customs. A nice way to show that Anya is newly human if we're new to the show and don't know that already. Buffy observes that Giles is doing the least amount of helping that could be called helping. He says he saw himself more in a patriarchal role, lots of pointing and scowling, which is very fun because it's essentially Giles acknowledging that being the patriarch often means not having to do any of the work. But in this moment, he does get to point and scowl at Xander and Riley, who rather than helping are play fighting. Xander expresses surprise that Buffy is giving up the corner suite, and Buffy says it's because she is home so much with Joyce sick, she might as well save the cash. Then she starts asking where Dawn is because she hasn't seen her in a bit. But Dawn enters, saying, some of your CDs are my CDs. Tara smiles throughout all of this, clearly enjoying the gang. One of them notices that Buffy is a bit achy after the big fight, and they joke about her getting the woman next time. And Tara says, yeah, you learn her source and we'll introduce her to her insect reflection. Willow is out of the room, and the others give Tara blank looks. Tara's face falls, and she says, um... That was funny if you studied Tagler and mythic rites and are a complete dork. I see this moment as the story spark or inciting incident for the main plot here. It is a bit later. Usually in a story, we see that about 10% through. But this season, it's been coming at different points, which I think is because season five of all the seasons is the most focused on the season story arcs and what I'll call sub arcs. So there is a lot more to carry through from episode to episode. And we see the inciting incident for the main plot, sometimes at different spots. The reason I think this sets off the main plot is it emphasizes to Tara that feeling that Willow's friends are just that, Willow's friends. They don't really understand her. They definitely don't dislike her, but she doesn't feel at home with them. 
And this is what prompts her to fear that they won't accept her and to take some drastic action later. Tara takes some boxes out. Willow comes in and reminds everyone that they are all meeting at the bronze for Tara's birthday. Anya asks about presents. She says, birth is a present thing. Xander says yes, and don't worry, he got something already. We find out later he didn't, but he's trying to reassure Willow that they didn't all forget. At 8 minutes 19 seconds in, we cut to Ben at the hospital. Another patient has been brought in with psychiatric problems, but who has no history of mental illness. This is one of those ongoing arcs from a previous episode where Buffy helped Ben with a patient. His shift is done. He goes to the locker room and starts to change. A demon with a white face that has lots of open sores creeps through the locker room. But Glory grabs him out of nowhere or it and tells it she needs a favor. We cut to the magic box. Anya finishes checking out a customer and tells them to please come again and make more purchases. Giles says, could we perhaps be a little less effusive, Anya? We don't want to frighten the people. But Anya is excited about having a place in the system of exchanging money for goods and her work for pay. This is another moment where we can contrast Tara with the group because Tara specifically said she doesn't feel useful, another way of saying not having a place. And here, Anya, who is newly human, does have a place, and it is exciting for her. Buffy enters with Xander, saying sure she forgot about Tara's party. Giles tells Buffy he's narrowed down the identity of the mystery woman, but all the open books on the back table in the shop say otherwise and Buffy observes your definition of narrow is impressively wide. Giles asks for more specifics and Buffy responds she was kind of like Cordelia actually. I'm pretty sure she dyes her hair. Not a lot of help for Giles but Xander and Buffy start going through the books while he works in the loft. Buffy asks Xander what he got Tara and he admits quote that was a tangled web of lies close quote, so that Willow didn't know he forgot. They both agree they don't know Tara that well, but she's nice. And then there's that thing of not understanding what Tara says. And as they're talking about it, Buffy and Xander finish each other's sentences, a wonderful way to show how well they know each other versus not knowing Tara but they both agree that she's super nice. They also talk about whether there will be a lot of witches there. Will it be a heavy Wiccan crowd and will they fit in? Last season and continuing into this season, witchcraft has often been used as a metaphor for Willow and Tara being gay and for their relationship. This is a nice moment of showing the characters who fit more with uh, maybe traditional values or society's values at the time being uncomfortable about going to somewhere where a lot of people will be Wiccan in in the show's language um, as a metaphor for straight people going where it's a crowd that's gay and and how unusual it is for them to feel out of place for them to feel like maybe they'll be the only ones in the room who are like that in that way which made me start thinking about why is the show still using this metaphor one it's been carried through so there's continuity but also if you are as a writer dealing with a topic that at the time is controversial as was showing a lesbian relationship at the time Buffy was airing you can make that more accessible to the general public by using metaphor. Now, we, we aren't doing that here because we already know this about Tara and Willow, but it can still help people step out of their entrenched viewpoints. You see how terrible Tara's father is to her over magic, and it's easier for someone who might hold prejudices against 
being gay, maybe unacknowledged prejudices against that to see the harm that that can cause. Now, I don't think that many viewers of Buffy had those biases, but we're not always aware what's going on in the back of our minds or what's kind of entrenched in us from how we grew up up and I feel like continuing to use the metaphor here was the show's way of getting the message across to the widest audience and when I say message across that's always tricky as well because if you write an episode with the idea of getting a message across you can end up with something like beer bad where it's very heavy handed to the point of making the story less fun here it works so well because it is a great story and it's a universal story most of us have felt alone at some time or another we have felt left out or feared people who care about us might abandon us if They knew who we really were, and that all makes that story so powerful. Xander continues to struggle with what to get Tara. He likes Tara because he likes Willow, and he knows what Willow likes. But Tara, I just know she likes Willow, and she already has one of those. And I love this line, and this is another universal theme that We can like somebody that our friends are partnered with or involved with, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we know that person well. And when it comes to gift giving, that can be a real challenge. And on a deeper level, when it comes to including that person, that can be a challenge. Buffy feels the same, and this is all giving her a headache with everything else going on. Tara's birthday is just one too many things to worry about. Xander tells her to relax, do something to work off the tension, which leads us right into the next scene, though it is a bit of a fun misdirect because at 12 minutes in, Spike and Buffy are fighting. It's a very acrobatic fight. And at first we think that this is how Buffy has chosen to work off her stress. But as the sexual tension grows, we realize it's just Spike's fantasy. The scene cuts to him and Harmony in bed. And afterwards, she asks him what he was thinking about. And Spike says, all about you, baby. Giles returns to ask about Buffy's and Xander's progress, and Xander talks about bath oil or candles, and Buffy says, I saw a really cute sweater at Bloomings, but I think I want me to have it. Giles is puzzled because he was asking about their research, and they explain they're talking about gifts. Giles says, you're in a magic shop, and you can't think what Tara would like. I believe you're both profoundly stupid. Sanders says he doesn't really know what witches like. What's he supposed to do? Get her a cheesy crystal ball? And Giles tells him he better not. Giles has already gotten one. So now we're coming to the first major plot, first major plot turn. It should come from outside the protagonist and spin the story in a new direction. And it often also raises the stakes. I think of it as the one quarter twist because in most novels, you reliably find it a quarter of the way through. But in TV episodes, it's sometimes later as it is here at 13 minutes, 35 seconds in. A young male customer comes in and he noses around the books and asks, are they full of spells? Like, can you turn people into frogs? Sander has a wonderful line. He says, yeah, we're building a race of frog people. It's a good time. Tara and Willow enter. Willow's laughing at the insect reflection joke because she gets it. And Tara's thrilled that she does and starts talking about the center of power. But she breaks off when she sees the guy who says, what's the matter? You don't have a hug for your big brother? And we cut to commercial. When we come back, Willow says, brother another example of having your character ask a question that the audience might wonder about because we've never heard anything about Tara's family and that keeps it from feeling like a retcon 
Tara introduces Donnie. Donnie teases her about this being more people than she met in all of high school. A nice way to emphasize how shy Tara was and how she perhaps has never felt she fit in anywhere. Now Tara's father and cousin Beth enter, and I have to do an aside because cousin Beth is played by Amy Adams. I looked her up on IMDb, and this is one of her earliest credits. She went on to do so much, the Superman movies, uh, the lead in Arrival, more things than I can list. So it is so much fun to see her here. Tara's father is not looking happy as he looks around the magic shop. And we find out they're all there for Tara's birthday, and the father wants to take Tara to dinner. She says, yes, sir. He apologizes for running out. He's double parked. And I thought, really? In Sunnydale? Somehow I don't think so. But then again, it is California, so maybe. Willow tells Tara her family seems nice. Another use of the word nice for uh, depicting somebody you don't really know. Tara says they're okay, and Willow, hearing the hesitation, says, yes, family can make you crazy. This is a great link to the next scene at 16 minutes, 47 seconds in. Buffy gets home where Riley is waiting for her. He got all Buffy's things back into her room and in order. They kiss. She really appreciates the favor and whispers to him that there could be outfits. Riley responds, oh, be still my heart. Dawn starts to head out to a friend's for dinner, and this is where we get that link to family making you crazy. Buffy tells Dawn it's not safe to walk there, and Dawn points out it's only across the street. But Buffy says it's family night, and anyway, that friend is a bad influence. Quote, I don't like you hanging out with someone that short. Dawn answers, I'm so glad you're moving back into the house. She huffs and stomps off. And Buffy tells Riley that Dawn makes her crazy. And Riley says that's the word he was searching for. And Buffy says, what? She shouldn't be going over there. And Riley says, yeah, a lot of young people are experimenting with shortness. Gotta nip that in the bud. Riley asks why she's so twitchy about Dawn. Buffy talks about this exciting and new demon chick, and they don't know what they're up against. Riley pretty reasonably suggests contacting Graham and the military. Maybe they know something. And Buffy shuts that down so violently that Riley's feelings are hurt, and he says, just a suggestion. I've been having fun lately writing the first draft of my latest QC Davis mystery. It's the sixth one, and I'm about 13,000 words in, so that's a little more than an eighth of the way through. And this is a much less bare bones draft than I usually do because I did a far more detailed outline of of it. Uh, if you've been on writing as a second career, you might see my post about a zero draft where you just speed through. And I'm doing something in between that and a more solid first draft because I have a more detailed outline, but also because it's the sixth book. So I have a better sense of which scenes are going to stay in and which I will eventually not need. That being said, I am struggling a little because there's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, this is dealing with the main character Quill's sister's murder over 36 years ago. So Quill never knew the sister. She was born after her and named after her and the murder of another little girl around that same time. So it's two cold cases. And there's a lot of background to get in, which is why I so love looking at how Buffy, the series, manages that, getting in that exposition in an interesting way. It's also probably why I found myself writing a post on writing as a second career about what do you do with scenes that are dull? 
it's a great reminder to myself for what to look at to make things move along quicker. The good thing, though, is I was so immersed in it that uh, someone knocked on my door and it really startled me. And and the funny thing is I, I was expecting the person. So it shouldn't have startled me. But I was really in the middle of that scene where Quill was questioning a suspect. Buffy tells Riley that the fewer people involved in dealing with this new demon woman, the safer she'll feel. And Riley says, every time I think I'm getting closer to you. And he says, I know you got a lot on your mind. You decide you want to let me in on any of it. You let me know. I'll come running. And he leaves. Buffy's choice to not tell Riley makes sense in one way because she's right the fewer people know the better and telling only Giles is probably the safest at least until they know what they're dealing with but she doesn't even explain to Riley that there is something and that she has a really strong reason for not sharing it I feel like there might have been something that she could do to make him feel more included and this is another theme in the episode of people feeling shut out and Riley feels shut out here also it might be that Buffy as she says about Tara's birthday she just can't deal with anything else right now she was on overload but it's significant As I was talking about on um, a bonus recording with Roberta Lip of the Mad Men podcast, they coined it. It is significant that Buffy doesn't seem to put Riley any closer to her in a way than Tara. It's, It's like she doesn't have room for Tara, who's sort of on the outer edge of her circle, who is Willow's partner, but not close with Buffy. And Riley is in that same category in terms of how much Buffy is willing to share. Now we go back to Tara. It's 19 minutes, 21 seconds in. She comes into her dorm room and her father's already there. He says the door wasn't locked and he was early. And he walks around her room saying he supposes she wanted him to see all these quote unquote toys. And he holds up an oblong crystal that is fairly phallic looking. So we're adding to that magic as metaphor here. And he goes on that he hoped she'd gotten over the whole witchcraft thing. And that if they let her go, she'd get it out of her system. This is leading to the midpoint reversal for Tara. And then she will later make a commitment. So as I've talked about more times than you regular listeners probably want to hear, a very strong midpoint typically has the protagonist making a major commitment or suffering a major reversal or both. Here, Tara's father warns her that she's turning 20 and she knows what that means. Quote, same age as your mother when she, and he cuts off. He asks if her friends even know, and she stutters when saying yes, and he knows she's lying. The father tells her she has to come home with him. She can't control what's going to happen. There's evil inside her that will come out and all this magic is making it worse. So this is the first time that we understand that it isn't just Tara not getting along with her family or them disapproving of her, whether it's witchcraft or being gay. It is that something terrible is going to trigger on her 20th birthday. When he says that about evil, Tara says, it doesn't feel evil, sir. And her father says, evil never does. At 21 minutes, 14 seconds in, so right about halfway through, the father tells Tara he doesn't feel like eating right now. He'll give her some time to say goodbye to her friends, but they need to leave by morning. This is another good technique to put a time limit on whatever it is that impending doom for the protagonist 
which for Tara is to have to go home with her family. And he says, your family loves you, Tara, no matter what. How do you think your friends are going to feel when they see your true face? And we see another of these wonderful links between scenes, this time with an image, because the scene cuts to the face of that demon we saw stalking Ben. It is tied up in Glory's closet. She throws shoes at it to wake it up, and she scoffs at it, saying she remembers when Laoc Demon was a proud warrior race, not lurking in hospitals looking for weak, sickly people to suck the marrow out of. But never mind, Glory needs info. She tells the demon about this girl who is blonde and rude and broke Glory's shoe and took her monk. Does the demon have any idea who that is? And the demon grunts in response. And Glory says, a slayer. Oh, God, please don't tell me I was fighting with a vampire slayer. How unbelievably common. If I had friends and they heard about this, and you know she's going around telling everybody. I mean, she's, she breaks off because the demon's attention has wandered and she is across the room in a second, gripping it by the throat, and she tells it to pay attention because my name is a holy name. She tells the demon to get its friends, and I think this isn't accidental. Tara's father has said, what will your friends think? Glory has alluded to not having any friends, and now she tells the demons to get its friends. Find the girl and kill the girl, okay, baby? And then she compliments the demon's cutest little superating sores. At 23 minutes, 14 seconds in, in contrast to all that talk of friends, Tara sits alone, staring at a crystal in her dorm room. Willow enters, tells Tara that Giles called a meeting, but Tara doesn't want to go. Willow isn't picking up on Tara's mood just yet, and she says Tara has to come, and maybe they could try a spell, the one to fight demons, even though it didn't work before, which is a really nice callback to last season when she and Tara did that spell to help Buffy find a demon, but Tara threw away the magic sand and the spell didn't work, which of course uh, Willow doesn't know. Tara says she's tired, they can do it tomorrow. Willow asks if Tara is sure she doesn't want to come with, and now the word friends comes up again because Tara says not everything is about your friends and stuff. Willow is taken aback, says sorry, and starts to head out. Tara apologizes. She'll see Willow in the morning, and Willow can fill her in. And now Willow inadvertently heightens Tara's fears because she says, great, we'll be demon hunters. At 24 minutes, 26 seconds in, Tara opens a spell book. So she is about to make a commitment. And this is something that When you are plotting your story, if you have a major reversal at the midpoint, one way to make sure that the time between the middle of your book and the next major plot turn is engaging is to then have the protagonist make a commitment because of that reversal, a commitment as a way to deal with the reversal. At the magic box, Giles starts the meeting Tara peers in through a door at the back of the magic shop. No one notices her. She whispers a spell to work her will on all of them and blows colored sand. It swirls around, goes into the room. Everyone freezes as it hits them. Then a second later, Giles resumes talking and nobody notices anything amiss. The scene cuts to a seedy bar and the bartender tells a patron that we can't see that he shouldn't be coming in there. He's got a rep with these monsters, yet he's there night after night. Is he looking to get killed? Based on this, we think this is Spike. Uh, We saw a similar scene with Spike before where he got dragged out of the bar by a demon. But the camera shifts and it's Riley who deadpan says he comes here for the ambiance. And the bartender says, well, if Willie was here and Riley responds, Willie's not here. This answers the audience question of, is this Willie's? And if so, where is Willie? The bartender we saw 
saw in the previous seasons. A pretty woman joins Riley and flirts with him. He buys her a vodka tonic and she tells him her name is Sandy. And this is the same actress who played Sandy, the young woman that Vampire Willow turned into a vampire in Doppelgangland. And Riley responds to her, oh, Sandy, 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 it's no good. My heart belongs to another. Besides, I don't go out with vampires. They're never interested in my intellect. This line presents another wonderful link because he has said he doesn't go out with vampires. They're never interested in his intellect. And we switch to Spike, who is a vampire who is very interested in Buffy. He's holding that mannequin head we saw before with the blonde hair on it. And he furtively puts it aside when Harmony comes in with shopping bags, gushing about how everything was on sale. And no, of course she didn't pay. She killed the sales clerk. But a sale is a sale. Harmony also heard from someone she ran into that a big wig from some nether region recruited a Laak demon to get others together and kill the Slayer. And does Spike think they'll be able to do it? Spike responds, God, that would be pleasant. Harmony thinks if the demons succeed, they should send a gift basket. Spike heads out. If the Slayer is going to die, he's going to watch. At 28 minutes, 36 seconds in, Tara is walking in the park and Cousin Beth runs into her. She was looking for her to see if Tara needed help packing and if she's okay. Tara informs Beth she is not going back with the family and Beth calls Tara a selfish bitch who doesn't care the slightest bitty bit about her family. Tara's dad is worried sick about her, plus he and Donnie have to do for themselves around the house. The horror of it, right? Quote, while you're living, God knows what kind of lifestyle. End quote. She goes on that Tara's friends will see what Tara is no matter how innocent Tara acts. Tara insists they won't see it, and Beth realizes Tara did some kind of spell and threatens to tell Tara's father. Tara says it was harmless just so they wouldn't see the demon part of Tara. We cut to the training room. Buffy is on an exercise mat alone. She's doing a stretching pose on her back. Her legs bent. Not the easiest position to get out of quickly. Willow hears someone at the door and she opens it. There are demons outside there, but she doesn't see them. And we cut to commercial. At 30 minutes, 38 seconds in, Beth tells Tara that Tara has been lying for years and now she put a spell on her friends and Beth asks, is that a human thing to do? Beth is going to tell Tara's father about the spell. He'll tell her friends and if she were Tara, she'd tell them first, quote, and then I'd tell them goodbye, end quote. At 31 minutes, 20 seconds in, the demons stalk through the magic box. They seem unsurprised that the others don't notice them or see them. Maybe they just don't care. They find Buffy in the training room. She looks around as they enter, though she can't see them. They attack and she fights and yells for Giles. More demons block Xander and Giles from going to help. One of them gets Xander by the throat. No one can see it, but Anya grabs something heavy and Willow grabs a chair and she gets there first and swings it down on the invisible demon. Spike dashes in the back and watches as the demons attack Buffy. He's happy, but he also can't help himself and dives into the fight. Buffy throws another one of them against the wall and takes off. She goes right past Spike, who's got a demon in a headlock, and he says a sarcastic, you're welcome. Everyone's fighting in the main magic box area, but no one can see what. Buffy tells them to shut up, and she listens. Tara enters from the front door and yells, Buffy, behind you, as one approaches. Buffy fights. Spike is still fighting in the training room, too. And Buffy says, Tara, where is it? Can you see it? So we are at the stage of the story where we should see the last major plot turn. I think of it as the three-quarter turn for where it usually appears, though sometimes it is a bit earlier or later. We could see that as 
the moment when Cousin Beth threatens to tell Tara or to tell Tara's father about the spell and to tell and that he'll tell her friends because that spins the story in another new direction now Tara has got to react to that she knows it's not an idle threat so she comes to see her friends or we can see it as this moment when Tara drops her head and utters the words to break her spell everyone can see the demons the fight continues Tara's family enter as Buffy kills the last of the demons just before it attacks the father and Tara's father said what in God's name is that and Spike responds Layak demon fun little buggers big with the marrow sucking and I don't think it's a mistake that this demon is named throughout the episode we don't always get the specific name of demons that attack Buffy and even when we do not usually as many times as here but there is a reason for it. Tara stutters out an apology to her friends says she was trying to hide and goes on to Willow I didn't want you to see what I am. The father explains to all of them that Tara is a demon. The women in his family all had some demon in them. Her mother had it. That's where the magic comes from. And he came here to take Tara home before, well, before things like this started happening. Giles is the first to realize that Tara cast the spell, and that's why they couldn't see the attackers. And Buffy says, nearly got us killed. Tara, ashamed, is ready to go with her family, but Willow protests. She tells everyone Tara just did a spell that went wrong. It was just a mistake. But the father insists Tara belongs with them. They know how to control her. And they definitely do, as Spike will point out in a bit, although not the way uh, the father wants Tara to believe. Willow very quietly says she trusted Tara more than anyone in her life. Was that a lie? And Tara says no. And Willow asks Tara if she wants to leave. Tara's father cuts in. It's not Willow's decision. And Willow says she knows that it's not. And she asks Tara again. The father says he's taking Tara out of there before someone does get killed and continues, quote, the girl belongs with her family. I hope that's clear to the rest of you. We're now moving toward the climax of the episode where the opposing forces, the protagonist and antagonist, have their final clash and the conflict resolves one way or another. If you are finding the story structure I talk about in the podcast helpful and want to try it out for your own writing, you are welcome to download free story structure worksheets. Just go to writingasasecondcareer.com slash story or to the website writingasasecondcareer.com and look for help with your story at the top menu. At 36 minutes, 40 seconds in, Buffy tells Tara's father that yes, it's clear. And Tara looks crestfallen, but Buffy goes on, if he wants Tara, he can take her. But, quote, you want to take Tara out of here against her will, you got to come through me. Dawn joins her and the father says he's not going to be threatened by two little girls. But Dawn says he doesn't want to mess with them. And Buffy says she's a hair puller. Giles stands behind them and says, and you're not just dealing with two little girls girls. This is an interesting moment I didn't notice until breaking down the episode, but we had Giles early on talking about being the patriarch and pointing and scowling, which is something that Tara's father has done throughout the episode at the magic shop in Tara's room, now regarding the demons, and in both instances, not really doing anything helpful or useful. But now Giles does something a patriarch can do, which is to support the women in his life. Now, they don't really need the support. Buffy certainly doesn't 
Tara's father is not going to be able to overpower her, but it is an emotional support. And though he's behind Tara and Dawn, he is really giving that support to Tara and support not in a way of taking away their independence as Tara's father wants to do, but in facing off against other men who are trying to do that. And Xander adds, you're dealing with all of us. And Spike chimes in, except me. Xander says, except Spike. And Spike clarifies, I don't care what happens. The father is outraged and he says, we are her blood kin. Who the hell are you? And Buffy says, we're family. An on-the-nose statement of the theme of the episode, yet it is so powerful and it means so much to Tara. Tara's brother tells Tara he will beat her down if she doesn't get in that car. Xander steps forward and tells Donnie he'll break something trying and Donnie ducks his head. He has given up and Beth says, I hope you'll all be happy hanging out with a disgusting demon. It's tempting to see all of what happened with Buffy standing in the way, supporting Tara as the climax. But remember, the climax is about the protagonist and antagonist fighting their last battle, whether it's a physical battle or an emotional or psychological one. So that has not happened yet, but it will. First, though, Anya asks in response to Beth's comment what kind of demon there are lots of kinds some are very very evil and some are useful members of society so that idea of usefulness again of having a place and the father responds evil is evil and Anya says let's just narrow it down I love this because this shows Anya also chiming in in support of Tara. And now Spike, who has said he doesn't care, will also be there for Tara, though perhaps he does it just for the fun of it, because the light dawns on him and he says, let's just make this simple and punches Tara. He doesn't punch really hard. They both yell in pain, though, and Willow yells at Spike, but then is thrilled because she realizes what that means. Buffy tells Tara's father that that only works on humans. So Tara is human. And Spike says, oh, it's a family legend, a bit of spin to keep the ladies in line. And Spike goes on, you're a piece of work. I like you. Then as he leaves, he says to the others, yeah, you're welcome. Now we get to the true climax because Tara as the protagonist needs to be the one to have that final face off. So that is something to remember if you are doing a story either with an ensemble cast or more specifically where another character might be stronger in other ways, might be a big part of your protagonist's victory. That is okay to do, but the protagonist needs to have that final confrontation herself And while Tara can't do the physical fighting like Buffy, she can't fight with the demons, she couldn't win a physical battle battle with her father or Donnie, but she is strong here emotionally. Her father tells her for 18 years the family has taken care of her and supported her. And Tara just shakes her head and says, Dad, just go. Her father says, magic. And Beth says, are you happy now? And Tara is. She smiles and the music changes. And this is the last link between scenes because we will now go to a scene where Tara is very, very happy. And this scene is the falling action where we tie up loose ends, resolve subplots, And here we continue arcs from previous episodes. At 39 minutes, 53 seconds in, we're at the bronze. There are balloons and presents everywhere. Tara is thrilled with all the gifts, including Giles' crystal ball. And Riley comes in with a present and joins Buffy. He kisses her. She seems happy he's there. Anya and Tara sit together and Tara explains the insect reflection joke. And Anya says she gets it now, but quote, it's still not funny. That is the end of a three beat about this joke. A three beat is where you use the same line or same concept three different times in three different ways. And typically the last one inverts or subverts 
the line. So in the beginning, Tara says the joke, nobody gets it. Then we see Willow understanding it. And now um, Anya gets it. And we might expect, oh, Tara's accepted. But being very plain spoken, Anya adds that it's just not funny. But it's okay. Tara doesn't mind that now because she feels comfortable. She and Willow go to dance and they talk a little bit more about her family. Tara was afraid if Willow saw what kind of people she came from, Willow wouldn't want to be anywhere near her. But Willow says it makes her more proud of Tara, makes her love her more because she became who she is despite what she grew up with. And Tara says Willow always makes her feel special and says, how do you do that? And Willow says, magic. They have their heads on each other's shoulders as they dance. The camera pans back and we see them gradually levitate above the floor and no one around them notices or cares. That is it for my breakdown of the episode. Normally, next I would have foreshadowing and spoilers, but today we have a special guest, Elena Campobasi, who will talk about themes of family, teen identity, and community in season five. It does contain spoilers. So if you are spoiler sensitive and don't stick around for that, thank you so much for listening. Come back in two weeks for Fool for Love, where a random vampire nearly kills Buffy and Spike reveals more than he meant to of his feelings for her. <laughs> Hi everyone and welcome to this talk. My name is Elena Campobassi and I'll be keeping you company at the end of some of Lisa's episodes. During today's talk, I shall comment on some of the key issues in Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 5, namely previous and emerging family structures as well as teenagers' identity, emotional and financial stability. The very first topic we're going to deal with is the family motive in Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 5. And we're going to do this by asking ourselves a question. Does family conflict with community? This question was first posed by Julie Hanlon Rubio, Professor of Social Ethics at the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara University, in his 1997 Theological Studies article. The question seems to be strictly related with scholarly and popular writings about family, as well as with depictions of it in the media and TV shows, including Buffy the Vampire Slayer. This question arises from a refusal to disconnect family and community, which is present in both Catholic social teaching on the family, together with recent teaching on the concept of domestic church, and also in the TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer, whose writers and producers provided an alternative version of the North American family, a version that clearly refuses to sever the concept of family from that of the common good, thus overlapping with the concept of domestic church. But what does this alternative family consist of? Contrary to other TV shows, such as Friends, Neighbours and Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, for example, Buffy the Vampire Slayer offers what's been called a collectivised matrilineal social order, which is embodied by Buffy and the Scooby Gang in the struggle against evil. This mythic storyline aims at contrasting failing parental figures with the mutual support Buffy is provided with by her closest friends Willow and Xander. Family is not always blood related, but it is friends. Although this is the family motive in the whole show, I believe season 5 deals with it the most. However, this doesn't mean that the show turns its back on block ties. We do hear Willow say she'd like to go see her mum in the episode forever, like we hear Buffy refusing Joyce's help in block ties by saying this is a family thing, we should deal with this, meaning her natural family. Yet the Scooby Gang does prove to be the actual family bond Buffy has, as they provide help on a caring, family-like and double level, in ordinary familial expressions of love and the ongoing struggle against evil. Now, the fusion of ordinary family obligations with the welfare of a broader community couldn't be more clearly expressed in Buffy the Vampire Slayer than through the character of Dawn in Season 5. On the one hand, 
Dawn is the key. She is precious to the word and pivotal in determining the word's fate. On the other, she is a fully accepted member of both the natural family and the Scooby gang. Even when the combination of these two ideals seems to break in the season final episode The Gift, Buffy's self-sacrifice aims to both protect her sister and to save the world, giving the show the opportunity to support once again the idea of a family that is founded not primarily on blood, but on love, mutual support and responsibility, as well as a mission to serve and protect the broader social community. But going back to the link between the show and the concept of domestic church, what is it and how is it connected with Buffy the Vampire Slayer? The term domestic church was first used by theologian Berg in 2002 to stress that the Christian family represents the smallest community of manifestation of the church. This idea of Christian family is not a new one, but rather it has deep roots in the New Testament and the early church although only recently has it started to be further discussed. Now, it has been claimed that family operates as a domestic church in two ways, by caring for its family members and by making them serve society through a personal and interpersonal social involvement aimed to common welfare and mutual acceptance. As a family, the Scoobies do seem to follow both principles. Yet this does not mean that the creators and writers of Buffy the Vampire Slayer were inspired by Catholic principles when creating the show. The show as a whole does include features that clearly could not be considered as supporting Christian values. But what has been suggested in the essay Buffy the Vampire Slayer and the Domestic Church is still a potential influence of the concept of domestic church on the show through the way the Scooby gang acts as a family for Buffy. Buffy the Vampire Slayer does challenge Christian views on families whose members are bound together by blood, marriage or adoption. Also, the show is clearly against stricter principles that are still maintained by some members of the Christian circles, such as the family as mainly built on authority and or heredity. In Buffy the Vampire Slayer, family is as family does. At the same time, biblical scholar Osiak highlighted how the New Testament does also include an extremely diverse array of family models that may even rival that of contemporary American culture. In this sense, it is still not clear whether Buffy the Vampire Slayer is always against the traditional Christian family. Part of the answer to this dilemma comes from an article I read by Jarvis and Burr that is entitled Friends of the Family We Choose for Ourselves. Here it is claimed that in fact Buffy the Vampire Slayer does not idealise traditional families nor alternative families. What relationships are in this show can be instead revisited in terms of Giddens' pure relationship, which I personally believe is a very interesting social concept. Giddens is an English late modernist sociologist who considers the birth of new patterns in the relationships between family members as not random, but rather as due to postmodern social restrictions and transformations. Within this context, Giddens refers to the rise of a new social phenomenon, which is called the pure relationship, which lasts so long as all parties provide each other happiness and personal fulfilment and do not feel the pressure of commitment. Now, it has been claimed that current social changes, such as increasing birth to teenage unmarried mothers, increased cohabitation before marriage, commuter marriages, increased divorce and single parenthood, and so on, may be evidence of the fact that people today, and especially women, are not willing to sacrifice themselves to a life they're not happy with, but they're rather more focused on their own personal fulfilment and satisfaction than they were in the past. Now, Buffy the Vampire Slayer shows alternative lifestyles within families, but is this the aim of the show to merely describe a social phenomenon, or is there anything else behind it? The nuclear family, although idealised in its abstract and sometimes unrealistic, idea of mutual love and affection ultimately fails in the show. 
and this is clearly shown through the representation of both vampire and human relations. When it comes to vampire relations, vampire families reject nuclear families as they usually destroy them by killing their biological relations. The vampire's severing of their old ties shows a desire to ultimately destroy an ideal. Nuclear families are not the kind of familial relationships that vampires can appreciate, both because of a lack of emotional ties to block family members and because of a refusal of that family structure. Although feelings do arise within vampire families, these are usually corrupted by infidelities, incest and jealousy. Let's take the relationship between Spike, Dala, Drusilla and Angel. Vampire's relationships are also feudal, as they're based on power and hierarchy rather than mutual respect and love. Its emphasis upon obedience, servitude and punishment due to failure to follow orders can sometimes be extreme. So although apparently based on a nuclear family structure, vampires and demons' familial relations ultimately show a failure of nuclear families in providing pure feelings of caring and affection. When it comes to human relations, nuclear families are often represented as disruptive and undemocratic in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. On the one hand, Dawn clearly struggles in developing a healthy and stable identity throughout season 5, where the discovery that she is the key and the following loss of her family bonds hinders her mental and emotional health. This, um, this is ultimately linked with Gideon's concept of empty identity, for which teenagers can no longer be guaranteed a certain identity by family bonds, but their identity keeps being redefined through their own experiences. Nuclear families are clearly depicted as undemocratic in Buffy the Vampire Slayer episodes such as Family, but Tara's patriarchal family structure hinders her growth as an independent, powerful woman. At the same time, this episode makes the clear statement that family is what its members want it to be, and that not only each and every one of them are willing to be part of it, but that they need to be accepted by it too. Now, while studying the show's depiction of the nuclear family, I couldn't help but wonder whether alternative families are a bed of roses. However mature and aware, as well as moved by care and affection towards their family members, alternative families in Buffy the Vampire Slayer feature an individual freedom that often leads to forms of disruption and conflict. In season 5, this is clear through Dawn's psychological and emotional instability, and at times abandonment by her family, and in particular by her alternative family. As each family member is free to move in and out, sometimes they tend to give priority to their own needs and desires, ignoring Dawn's cry for stability and guardianship. So there are things that the show's alternative families lack. The first one is mainstream values, consisting of socialisation and psychological stability, which are typical of nuclear families, but which are substituted by subcultural values in the show, namely the battle against evil. The second one is emotional and financial support. Buffy is clearly a metaphor for a single mother who is struggling both financially, having to take on mind-numbing jobs, and in providing emotional support to Dawn, putting her sister's needs aside while focusing on her own struggles in providing for her, keeping her guardianship and on a toxic relationship with Spike later in season 6. The second thing alternative families in Buffy the Vampire Slayer lack is dialogue. The lack of dialogue between Buffy and Dawn in season 5 is striking and mostly based on Dawn's reaction to Buffy's autocracy. Dawn is often excluded by the Buffy gang when it comes to matters that concern her directly, but with which she is not considered to be ready to deal. All this fortunately changes throughout the show, offering viewers an explanation and demonstration of the potential and often factual instability of alternative families, 
which nevertheless Buffy the Vampire Slayer considers as a better alternative to patriarchal, hierarchical nuclear families. Now, in my opinion, Giddens' concept of empty identity gives us a chance to witness new, growing social phenomena regarding the development of teenagers' identity, and to reflect upon them by asking ourselves a number of questions. From my experience as a secondary school teacher in Italy, I can't help but ask my students about themselves, their interests, their goals, their ordinary daily routines. Teenagers today seem to be more socially engaged with their own surroundings, mostly thanks to social media, in my opinion, than what I used to be. Being aware of current affairs might be easier today thanks to a wider and quicker access to resources and news that may appear on the social media feeds without the need to buy a newspaper or go to the library. The redefinition of identity as opposed to, or at least different from, the parents is largely evident as well, and also, and probably mainly, as a consequence of the access to a wider number of resources, both online and offline, than what their parents were allowed to or even knew of. Now, if this is true, then I see the possibility of constant redefinition through a widely huge array of decisions and calls which adults may sometimes mistakenly judge as right or wrong. While well, this redefinition can be an opportunity for teenagers to get to know themselves sooner and on more occasions than older generations could. However, I also believe this should never lead to a lack of any grown-up figure who can guide a teenager in building their own identity by means of dialogue and warning against the dangers of having to deal with it all by themselves. In the case of Dawn, I see her identity development as strictly connected to her relationship with Buffy as a role model, but also a hindrance to her own self-confidence. Also because of the kind of alternative family and instability Dawn experiences, she's initially unable to find a stable role model to look out for in times of internal turmoil, and not just in the daily fight of survival. Whereas I believe Buffy did have this role model with Joyce, who despite her flaws and occasional absence as a working single mother, never failed to provide Buffy with financial and, emo and emotional stability. Buffy herself was saying the, fo the, the following to Angel in the episode Forever. I can stick wood in vampires, but mum was a strong one in real life. She always knew how to make things better, just what to say. Dawn starts to finally build a healthy identity once her relationship with her sister is based on mutual respect and acknowledgement that Dawn is not a child anymore. Something that Buffy wasn't denied, even when her parents were on the brink of divorce and when she, still an immature, transgressive 15-year-old girl, had just discovered that she was a slayer. Despite being sent to a mental asylum, Buffy seems to have been supported by Joyce when things got tough for her. At the same time, in season 7, there's a democratic relationship between Buffy and Dawn, finally. While Buffy still does act as a teacher and mentor by teaching Dawn some combat and self-defense at the beginning of the season. I do therefore see an element of hierarchy, but this time based on mutual respect and affection rather than power and control. Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 5 serves as a mentor for both adults and teenagers to improve themselves as family members and to learn that they may not that there not may not be an answer to what being a perfect daughter, sister or parent might be, but that it will be a success if based on mutual love, caring, as well as discipline and guidance. Thank you all for listening and please feel free to comment the talk with your ideas and thoughts. I really hope to speak to you soon and let's lay it. Thank you so much, Eleanor, for all those insights. 
I love the way you dig so deeply into what Buffy is saying and the scholarship around Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And thank you to all of you for listening and to patrons who support the show. Come back in two weeks for Season 5, Episode 7, Fool for Love, where Buffy goes to Spike for answers about how he killed two slayers. If you'd like to connect or comment on the podcast, you can find me on Twitter at Lisa M. Lily, L-I-S-A, M as in Marie, L-I-L-L-Y. You can visit the Buffy in the Art of Story Facebook page or comment on YouTube, which you can get to through lisalily.com slash YouTube. You can find back episodes of Buffy and the Art of Story at lisalily.com slash Buffy Story. And you can find the book editions of Buffy and the Art of Story at lisalily.com slash Buffy Books. Music for this episode was written and performed by Robert Newcastle. Buffy and the Art of Story is a production of Spiny Woman, LLC, copyright 2021. All rights reserved.